don't think they have a peer. All right, welcome to wrap lecture eight on phase lock loops. So here's what we're gonna be talking about today. So first we have the motivation behind PLLs for phase lock loops, why we use them. And then we'll get into the nitty gritty details on how they work, how we implement them. And lastly, I write here a few nifty examples, if I do say so myself, that we shall see of PLLs. So first we have why we even care about frequency and phase locking. So phase lock loops implies your phase locking. Um, you also end up frequency locking. And so what that means is you have a, you know, a reference uh, sinusoid or, or uh, some signal of some frequency that you're trying to lock another oscillator to. And that locking might be in terms of phase, so the two oscillators have the same phase, or it might be in terms of frequency, so the two oscillators have the same frequency. And where does that come in use? Well, we talked about uh, receivers and, commu and communication systems a lot in prior lectures. And so in Remember, when we try to demodulate something, we need to have a carrier that is of the same frequency as the transmitter carrier. Otherwise, you have that weird rotation in the constellation diagrams and makes demodulation in, uh, kind of impossible. And so uh, if you are able to lock the frequency uh, of your receiver carrier to the transmitter carrier, that alleviates that problem. Uh, so similar to that is something called clock recovery, and that, that's kind of the same idea. So another application is something called frequency synthesis. And so, so say you were in a lab or something, and you have you, know, you have your oscilloscope, you have your frequency uh, spectrum analyzer. I mean, um, but suppose you're trying to say measure a filter, a fil the frequency response of a filter and you want to send in a sinusoidal signal that's swept in frequency uh, from you know, some low frequency to high frequency. And then the question is, how do you actually make that sinusoidal signal in the first place? And well, if you have an oscillator, you can change the frequency of the oscillator, but uh, there's no way of pre precisely knowing what that frequency of the oscillator is unless you have some reference that the swept oscillator is locked to. And so with a PLL, what you can do is you can have a known fixed frequency standard that's of a high quality, and then you could have a, another oscillator that is locked to the reference, but its frequency is swept. Uh, and so that, that this is something called frequency synthesis, not the actual sweeping of frequencies, but the generation of uh, very stable frequencies based on a known reference. And so similar to that idea is, uh, for example, in GPS satellites, GPS satellites have an atomic frequency standard using a cesium, and that, that enables them to generate a very stable or long-term stable uh, frequency standard. And so if you're on the ground, you could actually use signals sent by the GPS satellites uh, to lock your own oscillator to the GPS satellites uh, to act as a, a you know, your own, your own frequency reference. And so that, that enables you to get a very stable uh, frequency source. Um, and in order to do that, you, you do use phase lock loops, essentially. There's, it's a, it's a, not quite the same thing as a standard phase lock loop, but it's essentially the same technology. Then there's first phase noise reduction. So we talked a little bit about phase noise when we talked about oscillators. And so phase noise is kind of like the jiggling of your oscillation frequency from its, you know, its, uh, its average value. And that tends to be very, uh, you know, not unwanted. So what that can end up doing is say in a communication system, you're transmitting some uh, signal, but your, your carrier frequency has significant phase noise. And so if what that looks like in the frequency spectrum is if you were to plot 
the Fourier transform of your the output of your transmitter oscillator, instead of like a, something that looks like a delta function, instead it'll get smeared out across frequencies. So this is frequency, and uh, the effect that that has is that when you try to receive this at your receiver, um, remember when the receiver carrier frequency isn't correct, you get that weird rotation in the constellation diagram. Well, you kind of get the same thing here where uh, if the transmitter carrier frequency is kind of offset uh, from what it should be, that'll screw up uh, your, uh, your attempt at demodulation. And so by using a phase lock loop, uh, by locking your transmitter carrier to a, a, a standard, a frequency standard that has better phase noise, which is to say less phase noise, you can actually reduce the phase noise of your carrier frequency. And then last day right here, demodulation. So uh, phase locking, phase, uh, phase lock loops and variants of phase lock loops can actually demodulate uh, at the receiver, it can actually demodulate uh, signals without any extra steps while um, accurately tracking the carrier frequencies. So it kind of gets rid of the whole problem we had on the digital side of estimating the carrier, the, the transmitter carrier frequency and doing the demodulation in software. Instead, we could all do it, we could do it all in, in uh, hardware or software. Uh, you, you see phase lock loops on both hardware and software, um, but it does all of that while doing the, the frequency tracking. So, any questions about this before we move on? No questions. Okay. So, now we have some of the background information before we get to the actual PLL discussion. So, if we imagine we have a, some signal, some cosine. So, x of t is cosine 2 pi f naught t plus phi of t. And so, F naught is just some fixed frequency, of course. And phi of t is the phase of this signal. And the phase can vary in time. It doesn't have to be constant. But the key point here is that the total phase, the total instantaneous phase of this cosine is what's in the parentheses. It's the 2 pi F naught t plus phi of t. And so the way we more precisely define phase is that it's the integral of frequency. Well, two pi times that integral, but two pi is just a normalization. So we can take a look at this. We have two pi times the integral from zero to t of f of t dt. So what, what that's saying is that frequency is kind of like the, the rate of accumulation of phase. So if, if our frequency is say one kilohertz, uh, th that means we're accumulating two pi times a thousand phase, or so two pi times a thousand radians of phase per second. That, that's what frequency means. And then because these, this integral starts off at zero, we also have to add in the phase at time zero. And so if we were to work out this integral, in this case, the frequency is, um, uh, if you, if you work out this integral, the first term would end up being two pi f naught t, right? Because the integral of f naught is just f naught t. So you have two pi f naught t. And then you have to add in the, uh, the varying phase term. So that's instantaneous phase. Now, an instantaneous frequency is just the reverse, right? And so instead of an integral, we have a derivative. So instantaneous frequency would be one over two pi times the derivative of the phase with respect to t. And if you take the derivative of this expression with respect to t, what do you get? You get the two pi f naught divided by two pi, so just f naught over here, and then one over two pi times the derivative of this term right here. So long story short of this is that Phase is the integral of frequency. Frequency is the derivative of phase. And you can't have one without the other, right? Well, you can have instantaneous changes in frequency, right? Um, without instantaneous changes in phase because there's that integral there. 
the integral kind of smooths out any changes in frequency, but they are very much related. So imagine we had two uh, oscillators, right? We have oscillator one and oscillator two, one and two. And oscillator one has a phase of theta one and oscillator two is a phase of theta two. And suppose that these two oscillators were locked in frequency, right? So the frequency of oscillator one, F1 and F2, suppose F1 is equal to F2. Then what would there be any, and, and this is a two, and suppose we wanted to know the quantity theta, um, let's call it theta naught, is equal to theta one minus theta two. So theta naught is the phase offset between these two oscillators. So if these two oscillators have the same frequency, would there be any change in theta naught over time? No. Correct. So the fact that they have the same frequency means that the relative phase between the two will never change. All right, so now suppose we uh, got rid of this, got rid of this. So now suppose theta one equals theta two for all time. So that this means that the two oscillators are phase locked. What, what, would there be any difference between their frequency? You mean would it change over time? Right. So if I if I wrote f naught is equal to f two minus f one, what would f naught be? Would it be a constant? Uh, it is a constant, and more specifically, what would that value be? Zero. Right. So the fact that they had the same phase at all time means that their frequency must, their frequencies must exactly be the same. So if two oscillators are phase locked, that means that they are also frequency locked. So does, does that make sense? That this is kind of the key to why PLLs are useful. Right, because if, if we had two oscillators that had the same phase, but different frequencies, that would, first of all, it's impossible. But second of all, that, that wouldn't be much use to us because we need the frequencies to be the same as well. Right, okay. So, um, right, so on the receiver, for example, um, we have a, like when we're doing down conversion, for example, we have some sort of local oscillator that is driving a mixer. And if we wanted to uh, synchronize that local oscillator to the transmitter carrier, uh, we, we, we need to vary the frequency of that local oscillator until it matches the the carrier frequency. And so up till now, the oscillators we kind of looked at are all fixed frequency oscillators, meaning that we have no way of actually varying the frequency of the oscillation. And so in order to make a, a phase lock loop, uh, we need some way of varying the frequency of the oscillator. And so the way that's done is some, um, the, well, the the device that does that is uh, it's called a voltage controlled oscillator or VCO. And so the way we make one is using, uh, if you look at this diagram right here, uh, this is showing what is essentially a Colpitts oscillator that we saw before, except now we have this thing right here. So if you ignore this and you just short it from here to here, we'd have a Colpitts oscillator. Right, because we have the we have two capacitors, we have an inductor, 
they act as a resonant tank and the entire circuit oscillates at the resonant frequency of that tank. Now, by adding this circuit over here, we've essentially added a, another capacitor in series with the inductor. And so what that does is that it'll end up shifting the oscillation frequency by some amount. Uh, that amount is determined by the capacitance of this capacitor. But so if you ignore all of this, so if you ignore this part, oops. If you ignore this part right here, we've simply added a capacitor in series with the inductor. And so that, that ends up just shifting the uh, resonant frequency a little. But now if we add in this device here, we can do something quite magical. So this thing is called a varactor or very cap diode, it has a couple names. And what it is essentially is a reverse bias diode, right? And the thing about diodes is that they do have a parasitic capacitance you learn about in engineering too, right? You have your diode. And, you know, it's a PN junction or, or it might be a Schottky diode, there's no PN junction there, but it still has capacitance. And that capacitance changes as a function of the reverse bias on the diode. Um, and so what that means is that if we stick this reverse bias diode into the oscillator and we change its, its um, bias voltage, we can change its capacitance. And remember that the oscillation uh, frequency depends on this capacitance. And so we can, in effect, by changing this voltage here, we can change the frequency of the oscillator. And so that's exactly how VCOs are implemented. Of course, there's more complex arrangements, arrangements but this is the general idea. Um, note that there's a, there's, there's a resistor here. And so what that resistor is doing is that it's just isolating, um, you know, there's, there's gonna be some RF frequency on this diode. And so this resistor is isolating that uh, high frequency ripple from the DC bias we're applying here. And applying any DC will not affect the transistor bias, right? Because if you look at the, the DC path, you have a DC path through the inductor, but then you have these capacitors that block DC. And so applying any DC bias here will only affect the bias on the diode and not the transistor. So that's nice. All right. So, so that, that's how the VCO is made. We also want to characterize uh, a little how this frequency changes as a function of the voltage we apply on this uh, port right here. And so we define what's called a tuning gain. Tuning gain is just uh, how many Hertz does the frequency change per change in voltage, per, per volt change on this point right here. So like if we have one volt here, we might get, I don't know, 27 megahertz. And if we apply 10 volts, we might get, I don't know, 28 megahertz or something. The exact values will, of course, depend on the particular director and the actual oscillator. So we had a change of nine volts, right? And the frequency increased by megahertz. So we have one megahertz per nine volts. Um, and well, that's uh, uh, 0 0.11 uh, megahertz. Oops. So the tuning gain would be 0.11 megahertz per volt. Is it usually nice and linear like that, or is that just an example? Uh, it is just an example. So yeah, um, it's a good point. Um, you, the, it's, it's dangerous to assume that the tuning gain will be linear across its entire uh, 
the entire span of frequencies possible. Yeah. Maybe you can approximate it for yeah. some range. Okay. Well, so the way it actually ends up looking, if you look at the first, if you look at the capacitance of the re reactor, um, so you, you could technically use just regular diode, but regular diodes aren't optimized to be used as a reactor, meaning that their capacitance versus voltage curve is not linear. So reactors specifically are designed to have a fairly linear um, capacitance versus reverse bias voltage. So it's the like voltage, and this is capacitance, we'll look something like that. So as you increase voltage, the capacitance will decrease. Um, however, remember that the resonant frequency of this tank is inversely proportional to the square root of capacitance. Right, so that, that's one non-linearity non right there. Instead of, you take your linear capacitance versus, versus voltage, then you take the inverse and you square root it. So that's already something that uh, looks like this, which is definitely not linear. Um, so clearly you get the most, uh, the highest tuning gain when the slope is the highest and the least tuning gain when the slope is the lowest. And we'll see how the, the fact that the tuning gain changes, we'll see how that affects uh, phase lock loops. And it does have a significant effect. Um, and then usually we use constant K naught as a variable for the tuning gain, but and I'll, I'll use that later. Uh, of course, you could also do it in radians per seconds per volt. Um, that's just two pi times hertz per volt. So that's VCOs. So now we get to the actual PLL. So th this is kind of how it works on a high level. So we're not getting into any of the, the math yet, but we will. So there's three key components to a PLL. So on one side, we have the reference signal, that's the input. So this will be some uh, you know, cosine or sine wave of some frequency that we wanna track. We wanna track the reference signal essentially. We have the VCO right here and the VCO has an input. The input is the essentially the reactor voltage. So it's the tuning port of the VCO that controls the frequency. The VCO has an output, and that's just the output of the oscillator, just some sort of uh, cosine sine wave of, of a frequency that depends on the VCO uh, control signal. And, uh, and then we get into the phase detector. So the VCO output and the reference signal are fed into the phase detector. And what the phase detector will spit out is the difference in phase between the reference and the VCO. So if the reference has some phase theta one and VCO theta two, the phase error, which is the output of the phase detector will just be theta one minus theta two. And the PLL will try to minimize this error. So the error goes into what's called the loop filter and the loop filter will basically modify the loop dynamics and the output of that filter will go into the VCO control port. And by virtue of negative feedback, all of this acts to minimize the phase error as we'll see. So right now it's a little hand wavy, but we'll see how it actually works. So, Right, so this is kind of in terms of actual signals in the time domain, but we can move to the phase perspective. So instead of looking at you know, x of t, which is equal to cosine of you know, two pi f t plus theta or whatever, we can instead only look at the phase of the reference uh, signal. So in this case, I'm calling it theta r. So remember phase is 
uh, includes the two pi f naught t as well as the, the phi t that I wrote earlier. So theta r of t will increase over time because you have that two pi f term that'll uh, continuously increase phase uh, at a rate of the frequency of the signal. So we have theta r, and then on the output of the VCO, we have the same thing. We have a, I call it theta naught here. And this theta naught is essentially the output of the PLL, right? The output of the VCO is the output of the PLL. And we want that phase to be locked to the reference phase. So then we have this magical block here, the phase detector, which subtracts the two and gets you the phase error. So this would be theta r minus theta naught. And that goes to the loop filter. And here I write f of s. So this would be the Laplace transform of the loop filter. And we'll see why Laplace is very useful. And that is uh, the output of that is still the VCO control signal, C of t. And here, this is kind of interesting. Remember that uh, the phase is equal to the integral of frequency. So the VCO, is sent in, in, if you're thinking about it in terms of phase, is essentially integrating the frequency times the tuning gain. And that gives you the output phase of the VCO. And so if you were to think about this in terms of the Laplace domain, the Laplace transform, this would be K naught over S, right? Because integration over in time is one over S in the Laplace transform. All right, so far so good. Hopefully. Okay. Yeah, so the, that phase term is just the thing inside the cosine, the two phi f naught t plus phi of t, right? Right, exactly. So, okay, yeah, and it just, okay. Right, and remember that with the VCO, uh, the frequency of the VCO but what it's actually equal to is some um, fixed frequency plus k naught times the, or I should write, instead of v, be consistent and call it c of t, because right, the control input is c of t. Mm -hmm. And that gets multiplied by the tuning gain. And then you add that to just the the nominal frequency of the oscillator, and that, that becomes your the frequency of your VCO. And then to get to the phase of the VCO, you integrate this uh, with respect to time. Mm -hmm. um, I have like a question that might kind of hark back to something you said earlier. So you said if the frequency, like if the, if you have two cosines, if the frequency Determine both is equal, um, then it's possible that they're offset by some constant uh, phase term, right? Right. But um, you said also if like capital theta one and theta two are equal, then um, you said that the difference in frequency must be zero. Is that what we said earlier? So if they're equal for all time, then their frequencies are the same. Okay, yeah, the, the all time thing was what was bugging me because because it, it's possible like at the very at like time t equals zero, they can be equal. But if the oscillators aren't at the same frequencies, then that will very quickly become unequal, right? Right, exactly. So, okay, I, I just want to double check. I was understanding okay. that right. Yeah, that's the the right insight. Okay, so um, now, now we need to look at the implementation of this phase detector because that is kind of important. We, we want to know what's the behavior of the phase detector as these input phases change. And if you think about it, um, creating a component that takes out the phases of the input sinusoids and takes spits out the difference 
that's a fairly nonlinear operation, right? Because I mean, say you have two sinusoids, um, linearity would imply that uh, if you change the amplitudes of either input, the output will change as well. And that's definitely not the case with uh, taking the difference in phase because the phase doesn't care about the amplitude. So clearly to actually implement a phase detector, we need a nonlinear circuit element. And good thing we've already looked at this. Uh, so the, there's a few different ways to implement phase detectors. Um, one way is with a mixer, and that's the one we'll take a look at. There's also something called a charge pump phase detector. And that's a charge pumps. Um, you might hear the term in power supplies. This is completely different. Um, but I, I won't really get into it. But basically, it's, it's kind of like a digital state machine. Um, the way it works. And if one input has a higher phase than the other, then it'll uh, try to increase the charge on a capacitor. And if one input has a, yeah, the opposite, like if input two has a higher phase than input one, then it'll try to decrease the charge on a capacitor. And so the, the voltage on that capacitor will be the output of the phase detector essentially. But we won't really get into that. And so that there's some others. But the classical method is just with a mixer. And so we'll see how the math works out here. This is the diode ring mixer that you implemented a while back. And it could be the mixer you use here. Um, there's many other types, but that's one particular implementation. So anyway, uh, suppose we have two signals, X of T and Y of T, and they're just two sinusoids. So in this case, X of T is a, is a sine of two pi F naught T plus theta one of T with amplitude A1, and Y is amplitude A2 cosine 2 pi F naught T plus theta 2 of T. So these two have the same frequency. Um, sine and cosine are 90 degrees out of phase, and they have an additional phase offset, theta 1 minus theta 2. All right. So the, the goal here is that we want to get the, the output of the phase detector, essentially, will be theta one minus theta two. That's, that's the goal here. So if you multiply the two, which is essentially a mixing operation, we have A1, A2, we have the sine, we have the cosine. And then after some trigonometric identities uh, that you can work out, they're not too hard, I, I did it for you. But what you get is A1, A2 over two times and everything in brackets here. You have two terms essentially. Oh no, I didn't fix this. Uh, oh no, uh, one second, let me, let me fix this. You have, you should have two terms. One is uh, four pi ft um, This is times this, and then this term should not be there. All right, now we're good. Okay, back to the regular thing here. So what you get is A1, A2 over two, times two terms this time, not three. You have sine of four pi f t, which would be f not t, plus theta one plus theta two, plus sine of theta one minus theta two. And so you can kind of see this is the term we're interested in because we have the difference of the two phases. And then this term, there's, couple things to notice here. We have the theta one plus theta two, but assuming that theta one and theta two are slowly varying with respect to the actual frequency, which is almost always the case, this is double the frequency of the of X and Y, which means this term is much higher in frequency than the other term. And so similar to when we did IQ demodulation, if we just low pass filter this entire thing, 
we get rid of this term that we're not interested in, then we get a1, a2 over two times sine of theta one minus theta two, right? And this is essentially the output of the phase detector. And I'll call that theta e. And you might notice, well, that's a sine of theta one minus theta two. That's not theta one minus theta two. And that's true. And so I, I plotted a sine wave down here and it's just a generic sine wave, sine of x. But if you assume that theta one minus theta two is small, which is to say we're localized in this region of the sine wave, then you can approximate this as a linear straight line, you know, y equals x. And we say that sine of theta one minus theta two is approximately theta one minus theta two itself. And if you do like the Taylor series expansion of sine of x, um, you'll have x minus, you know, an x cubed term and so on. So we're essentially just uh, ignoring the higher order terms because the small value cubed or raised to the fifth power or so on is much smaller than the value itself. So that's why we're able to get rid of those higher order terms. Um, and if you actually look at it, it looks like a straight line at zero. And so th this is kind of the same approximation you make when you look at pendulums, for example. Um, you, you make that, you know, you got your pendulum, and you look at, you know, what's the frequency of oscillation and velocity, whatever. You have the same thing pop out of sine of the angle. And if you assume the angle small, then it becomes linear. So anyway, uh, we can lump all of this into one term here. So I'm calling A1 times A2, I'm calling that A0. And then the one half I'm calling KD. So KD is like the, the gain of the phase detector. And A0 is the input amplitude to the phase detector. So if you make the linear approximation, the overall output of the phase detector, which is the error signal essentially, is A0 KD times the difference in phases. And so you may wonder, well, we started with a sine and a cosine, and we were trying to minimize the output of the phase detector, which is theta one minus theta two. So you might think, well, if we minimize theta one minus theta two, then we're, we're stuck with a sine and a cosine, which are still 90 degrees out of phase. And you'd be right. So the, if you use this type of phase detector in your PLL, what the PLL will end up doing is trying to, it'll try to make the, uh, the, the relative phase between the reference and the VCO 90 degrees uh, offset, not zero. And that's just a, kind of a quirk of the design. Um, and it doesn't really play a huge, it doesn't, it doesn't make a huge problem in demodulation because you can always correct for that phase offset um, in software very easily. The frequency offset is a little harder, and uh, but that's taken care of with the PLL. So if the phase offset is a problem, there's ways to correct for it. All right, so if we make that linear approximation, then we could replace that phase detector block with just a summing block where we take theta r minus theta naught, the output is theta e, and we multiply that by kd. So you know, really I could add like the um, amplifier here with the gain of kd, but that, that's all it's, all it's saying, or I should say a naught kd. Um, and then that error goes into a loop filter and here I'm making a, an assumption, and this is kind of a design choice. The, um, I'm saying that the loop filter has this form, and this form is a first order low pass filter. So remember that the output of the phase detector had that high frequency component and the error term, and we wanted to get rid of the high frequency component. Well, that's what this loop filter does. 
it's a low pass filter that filters out that high frequency component that only leaves you with the error term. So anything after the loop filter is just the error term. So that's why we're able to ignore it. And uh, here I chose one over tau s plus one, you know, this is Laplace domain. And um, maybe somebody could suggest what that filter would look like if you were to implement it with R's and L's and C's. Any suggestions? What type of answer are you looking for? Well, what, what is one way of creating a first order low pass filter? You have a capacitor. Yes. And uh, the capacitor is tied to ground. Yes. And the signal passes above the capacitor. Yes. I'm sorry. Yes. Right. Uh, no, no, no. To the left as well, please. Okay. Okay. So the input is from the left. Yes. Uh, the capacitor, any high frequency stuff will get passed through it because the impedance of a capacitor is uh, one over J omega. So it'll get shunted to ground and only the low frequency component will be allowed to pass. Um, that's correct if you added one more component. So if I just connected a signal source here, the output, if I take it over here, is directly what the signal source is generating. Ah, a resistor. Yes, yes. I wasn't, I wasn't sure if you're talking about like, hey, do you, did pop quiz, you guys remember all the filters we talked about? <laughs> like, Well, if you're uh, talking about the LC filters, uh, remember that LC filters, if you just have an L and C, you get a second order filter. You don't get a first order filter. So it's... You, you can't make a first order filter with just an L and a C. You need a resistor and a capacitor, or you could have an inductor and a resistor. Um, the easiest way of uh, course is just a resistor and capacitor. Right. So if I asked you um, what the time constant of this guy is, we should all hopefully say RC. That's right. I messed up. Uh, RC. So if you were to write the uh, transfer function of this filter in the Laplace domain, it would just be this right here. Right. So that's very easy implementation for the filter. Um, there's more complex filters you can use. And the reason why you'd want to use more complex filters is that the loop filter essentially determines the dynamics of the entire PLL. And so choosing exactly where to place your loop filter pulls will determine you know, how fast your PLL will be able to lock. Um, will it be unstable and so on. So have either of you taken 141? Alexi's in it right now, right? Nope, 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 nope. <laughs> oh wait, did you drop it? Uh, I never took it in the first place. <laughs> okay. I, I'm mixed up. I, I, I dropped it before the quarter started, which means no. <laughs> All right, well, go with me for now and let me know if things make sense. Okay. So we can define a quantity called the loop gain. And so what the loop gain is, is that we essentially cut open the loop, the feedback loop at some point, let's say right here. And we'll go in a circle around the loop and measure how much gain we accumulate uh, in doing so. So let me, let me clean this up a little. So if I go around the loop, well, first I have the phase detector and that'll give me uh, uh, A naught times KD, 
right? So, you know, I keep going. And then I get to the loop filter and that gives me the one over tau s plus one. And I keep going and I get to the VCO and I get a K naught over S and I keep going and then I get to the end of the loop. So if I write all of that out, you get the loop game. Right? Yeah. Okay. So now, now what I want to figure out is what is the transfer function from input to output? So in this case, I'm defining the output as the output phase of the VCO and the input is the reference phase. So the way we figure that out, um, you can go through the math, right? And I'll, I'll write out what this looks like here. So if we have something that looks like this, Uh, this is essentially what this PLL looks like, right? We have the input, we have the output, and we have a couple, uh, you know, uh, internal transfer functions essentially, right? So A might be the loop filter, B might be the VCO, and I forgot to include A not KD, but it would be there as well. Right, so now we want to figure out what is the transfer function output over input. Well, that's not too hard to figure out. Say we call the output y and the input x. Well, y is equal to, uh, what is it? It's uh, x times a, a not kd times transfer function of a and b, right? Um, th that would be the case if we didn't have this feedback loop. Well, but, right, or I guess, uh, let's see. Well, the input is equal to y plus whatever you're inputting, right? Or, um, um, yeah, so you have to be careful here. Um, let me lump these three things together into L of S, the loop game, just to make simplify the math. Um, but so y is equal to, if you look at it directly, it's uh, input, which is x minus x y minus, yeah. times L of S, right? Right, and then you refactor, like move things around to isolate y. Right. And so we end up getting is this. Assuming I did things right. Y over x. Yeah, um, right. Okay. So that's that. Um, and then, so down here is what I, I did exactly that. So if you do L over one plus L and you simplify things a little, you get this. Uh, and so just taking a look at this, you can see that the denominator has, uh, it's a quadratic equation or quadratic function. So it's a second order system essentially, right? So that, that means it has two poles. And um, the DC gain is one. That's not too important here. But the, 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 the main point here then is that we can figure out the poles of this system and the poles depend on tau, A naught, KD and K naught. And we can modify the loop dynamics, which is to say, if we feed in a, a phase, how will the loop respond to that phase? We can change all of, the, all of those dynamics by modifying these parameters here. Um, and if you haven't taken 141, you won't know how to do that. But 
I'm saying that you can. <laughs> so I have a yeah. Well, you you finish up first. I had a question after you. Well, that's all I have for this slide. Okay. Um, so a naught is equal to a one times a two. Is that that's how we defined it, right? Right. Um. It it bugs me a little that the phase error depends on the amplitude of the signals because right. like like if you if like if you have two things and they're both have have the same amplitude then the phase error will be one thing but then if one has a, a higher amplitude even if the phase error stays the same then your the phase error signal is going to be different right correct yeah. but if the phase error is zero then there won't be any difference right um but your thing will respond differently depending on the amplitude of the inputs and Correct. what happens if the amplitudes aren't constant like i don't know if you have an amplitude modulated signal um, what happens then yeah so th um that's a very good point so then you get into the realm of you know like time variant uh systems so it's no longer lti so what that means is that you can't assume LTI-ness and you can't define a fixed transfer function anymore. And so you need to um, use more complex methods. But, but you bring up a good point, which is that this entire loop is highly nonlinear or non-time invariant, depending on what exactly you're doing. And that'll play a big role in A, determining the loop dynamics if you have any modulation going on or equivalent. Um, and B, determining at what point does nonlinear, oh, at what point does linearity, the linearity assumption fail to hold and things begin to break down. And in order to answer that, um, well, I can't say all of it's been answered, but in order to answer at least part of that, uh, I would take a class in dynamical systems. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah. And again, remember the VCO is nonlinear as well, and that's another issue. And I'll, I'll talk a little, little bit about the problems we run into later. So it won't all be hand waved away. Don't worry. <laughs> All right, so now for some examples of the PLL working. So here's the, the setup. I have a free running VCO. So it, the, the loop is open and I've given it a 100 kilohertz frequency offset from an input reference and the reference is set to 27 megahertz. So because the VCO is offset by 100 kilohertz, we expect the uh, the VCO will essentially lap the uh, input reference, 27 megahertz, every um, 10, kilo, uh, 10 microseconds, right? Because the period of 100 kilohertz is 10 microseconds, if I did my math right, which means every 10 microseconds, the phase uh, accumulation from the additional phase accumulation from this 100 kilohertz offset will equal 2 pi which means the two, uh, the VCO and the reference will line up every 10 microseconds. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, so what I'm plotting here first is the two waveforms from the VCO and the reference from zero to one microsecond. So in this case, the VCO is blue and the reference is red. So we see uh, as time increases, the VCO is, uh, well, the offset between the two is increasing over time. Uh, I think I might have gotten the offset backwards. It might be the other way around. It might be minus 100 kilohertz. But regardless, that, that's beside the point. Um, the point is that the offset increases over time. When you're saying free running VCO, you just mean like, hey, it started with an offset and there's nothing being done to correct it. That's what I mean, right? Okay. 
So what I essentially did is I grounded the tuning port of the VCO so it stays at zero volts. Right, and they, they start off at the same phase as well. That's another point. And then, so on the bottom here, I'm plotting the same thing except from 24 microseconds to 25 microseconds. And you see at this point, the phases, they're, they're almost 180 degrees out of phase and they'll keep uh, you know, being in phase and then out of phase every 10 microseconds. Uh, and the reason I didn't plot from zero to 25 microseconds it's because it wouldn't fit on the slide. <laughs> Otherwise, I would have. All right, so here's the PLL setup. And I did this in an ADS, but you could easily do it in, well, I shouldn't say easily, but you could do it in LT Spice as well. Um, so what I have here, you know, at the bottom, here's the VCO. Um, you see the frequency is FC. So here I've defined FC to be 27 megahertz. So it's FC plus 100 kilohertz, so one times 10 to the fifth. And then the reference is right here. And here the frequency is FC. Um, the, uh, the amplitude of both of these is one. So I mean, written here it's 10 dBm, but 10 dBm is one volt uh, amplitude. So that, that's equivalent. And then we have the mixer. It's just a, this is just an ideal mixer. So it multiplies the two, gives you the sum and difference frequency. In this case, the sum is the high frequency component we don't care about. And the difference is the error signal. And so that goes into a loop filter. Here I have one kilo ohm and one nanofarad. So if you do RC, that's a one times 10 to the minus six uh, is the time constant of that. So essentially there is a, the, the cutoff frequency would be one megahertz, which is sufficient to cut off the uh, 54 megahertz that's coming out of here. Remember that the, the double frequency component is at 54 megahertz because twice 27. Um, and so that's sufficient to uh, filter that out. And the output of that filter goes straight into the VCO control. And the tuning gain here, here it's written as KV is equal to one kilohertz, 100 kilohertz per volt. So it's exactly the same sort of thing we've been talking about. So with that in place, um, you can see from zero to one microsecond, the loop is definitely doing something. Because if I go back, remember there's a very small change in phase from zero to one microsecond. Now it's, it's uh, becoming much more dramatic. But remember that the output of the phase detector, uh, when, when the two inputs are in phase will give you, it'll be zero when they're 90 degrees out of phase. Remember we had sine and cosine inputs, not cosine and cosine. So the PLL will try to make the, the reference in the VCO 90 degrees out of phase. That's its entire purpose. All right, so it's, it's trying to do that at the beginning and then at the bottom here, I'm plotting from 24 to 25 microseconds. And by this point, it's already achieved that. So if you look at these two, they're essentially 90 degrees out of phase. And if I plot from, you know, the top is still 24 to 25 microseconds, but the bottom now is doing 29 to 30. Then you see that the phase difference hasn't changed. There's still 90 degrees out of phase. And they'll remain 90 degrees out of phase until the PLL turns off. Right? Very cool. Very. So now um, we can take a look at the loop, how the loop performs over time. And this is kind of like the step response, right? Because we're at time zero, we're essentially suddenly changing the, the uh, frequency offset of the VCO by 100 kilohertz. And you can see they start off at zero phase offset right here. And it'll overshoot a little and then undershoots and eventually settles out to a flat 90 degrees or this isn't, this isn't 90, uh, this is actually 120, but uh, 
I'll say that they, they settle out to a flat um, uh, phase offset. So the phase offset doesn't change anymore, which means that the frequencies are identical. And if you look at the input to the VCO, the control signal, you see it starts off, you know, it rapidly jumps up to this high value here at around three volts. And then it quickly falls, undershoots, and then ends up at minus one. But remember the tuning gain was 100 kilohertz per volt, which means if our control voltage is minus one, we've subtracted 100 kilohertz from the free running VCO uh, frequency, which gives us the nominal or the, the, the 27 megahertz that we want. Are you hoping we don't ask you why it's 120 and not 90? <laughs> I was gonna get to that right now. Okay. Um, the reason why it's 120. So when, when, when I said that the PLL will try to make the, uh, it'll, it'll reduce the frequency offset to 90 degrees, I was lying a little. Uh, what, what it will actually do is it'll try to make the error as small as possible, um, as small as possible for, and, and well, I should say it'll try to make it constant and not change over time, which is, which is to say that the, the phases are locked with an offset and that offset is not, uh, you know, readily, it's not a fixed number. It's not 90 degrees per se. Um, so the reason that is, is in order to have a constant phase offset, we need the frequencies to be the same. And in order the frequencies to be the same, we need this to the VCO control voltage to be a non-zero value, right? Because the VCO control voltage in this case needs to be minus one in order for the VCO to have a frequency of 27 megahertz. And if we go back here, the VCO control voltage is coming out of this low pass filter. And the input to this low pass filter is the error signal. So in order to have a non-zero control voltage, we must have a non-zero error signal. That makes sense? Right, because yeah. in, st in steady state, this capacitor is essentially open. So we just have a resistor going straight from the error to the control. So they'll be 90 degrees apart plus whatever volt uh, error is necessary, constant error term is necessary to input into the VCO so that it, uh, so that the frequency difference becomes zero. Exactly. Okay. And the, the other way to look at this, um, and it helps to have taken 141 before, but if you look at the loop gain of this PLL, you'll notice it has a one over S term right here. And what that means, you remember what one over S is essentially an integrator, right? And what we say is we call this a type one system. Uh, and type one refers to the power of one over S. So if you had one over S squared, it would be a type two system. If we just had one, it would be a type zero system and so on. And the reason I bring this up is that a type one system uh, does not, um, it cannot track, uh, like if the uh, frequency, for example, the reference phase frequency was increasing over time. Uh, the frequency of the VCO would kind of look like this. It would try to catch up to it but there would be some constant offset between the two. Now, equivalently, um, so if we had a type two system instead of type one, 
which meant there's a one over S squared term. If the input frequency was ramping up, you could actually track the ramp perfectly. So far, so good. The, the reason why that is um, takes, it's a little bit of math to show it, but uh, go with me for now. <laughs> now, re remember that <clears throat> phase is the derivative of frequency, right? So if we took the, uh, right, so say we had a, um, sorry, phase is the integral of frequency, not derivative. So say we had a frequency step, right? So this is frequency. And if we look at the phase as a result, uh, the, the, the reference phase, it would start looking, it would become a ramp, right? Because we would be integrating this step and it would become a ramp. And remember, this is a type one system, which cannot uh, perfectly track ramp inputs. So in effect, we'll get something that looks like this. That's the bad drawing. So that the VCO phase, it'll try to track the ramp, but it'll always have some offset to the reference. And that's what we're seeing, right? We're seeing that if we step the VCO frequency, which is equivalent to stepping the reference frequency, just the opposite direction, uh, that'll cause a ramp in the phase and we can't perfectly track uh, uh, ramps with this system. So there'll always be some constant offset. And what that offset will be depends on the size of this step. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. You'll, you'll learn more about that in 141. Okay. So, any other questions? Okay. So, so that's how a PLL works. Now the question is, how do we use it for useful things? And so I mentioned demodulation earlier. So we could use PLLs to directly perform FM demodulation, right? So frequency demodulation. And the way to see that is if I go back to the PLL itself, right? If the reference, if uh, the reference say that was what's being transmitted and that what we're receiving on the receiver, say that was, you know, a cosine, of two pi f plus delta f of t times t. So essentially, this is our frequency modulation term. Right, we're moving the frequency up and down, and that's our frequency message essentially. Well, if we feed that into the PLL. That means it, it'll try to track that frequency. And that means that the control signal here will essentially equal uh, delta F of T. And so that, that quite cleanly performs frequency demodulation. Okay, so if we're able to perform frequency demodulation, what about amplitude modulation? And it can kind of also do that. So if we send in an amplitude modulated signal, um, the PLL will try to track the frequency of that amplitude modulated signal. 
Um, and this is kind of what you alluded to earlier, where if the amplitude of the signal is changing over time, which means that the loop gain is also changing over time. But as long as that amplitude stays within a, a fixed range where the PLL is stable, then it'll work essentially. And uh, we'll get a VCO whose frequency is the same as the amplitude modulation frequency. And if we perform an additional mixing step where we mix the VCO, with the um, uh, amplitude modulated signal, uh, we'll get our sum and difference term. The difference term will be a baseband and it'll be the amplitude modulation. So that, that's how you perform amplitude modulation in this case. Now for BPSK demodulation, there's some issues here. Because remember, every time we go from a one to a zero in BPSK, we're flipping the phase of the carrier by 180 degrees. And if we fed that into the PLL, the PLL will try to track that phase flip, but that's a problem, remember, because every time it, the PLL will try to change, uh, will try to track phase, it'll cause the frequency of the VCO to change. And remember that when we try to uh, demodulate a BPSK signal, with a, a frequency that's not the same as the carrier frequency of the transmitter, we get a mess. So clearly this won't work directly. And so there's a modification we can make to the PLL and that is called the Costas loop. And so the Costas loop is essentially a PLL except does some fancy stuff. So if we take a look at this diagram at the bottom, you see there's two mixers right here. And they're being fed by uh, the, the VCO, except one is 90 degrees out of phase with the other. And remember, this is exactly how we do IQ demodulation, right? We multiply with the sine, we low pass filter, we multiply by the cosine, low pass filter, and that gets us our I and Q channels, right? So, the bottom one's cosine, so that we can call that I after the low pass filter. And the other one is Q. Now, if the VCO is not in phase with the, the carrier here, then this will be I times you know, cosine or sine of the phase difference. And this will be Q times uh, cosine or sine of the phase difference, right? Um, or, well, not, not quite that, but uh, something that's proportional, or not proportional, but uh, a function of the phase difference between the, the, uh, the receiver VCO and the transmitter carrier. And so, if you assume BPSK, then Q is zero, and I goes from one to minus one. And if we multiply Q and I, if these are in phase, then we should get zero. If they're out of phase, if, if uh, the carrier and the VCO are out of phase, then Q will be non-zero, right? Because we've essentially rotated the constellation diagram, and now the Q term is non-zero. And that means that the Q term times the I term is non-zero, which means we'll get some error term over here. And after this point, we're exactly like the regular PLL, where we feed that error term into a loop filter. The loop filter goes to the VCO control input, and we would go in a loop, repeat the process. Right, so that that's how a Costas loop works, at least for BPSK. There's other things you can add for QPSK or QAM, uh, but it's the same idea. Where instead of directly uh, multiplying the VCO and the carrier together to get the, the error term, we do an additional multiplication uh, uh, to get rid of, well, to take, it, take into account the I and Q modulation. <clears throat> 
So this, this, and the, the nice thing about this is that we don't need to perform the demodulation in software. Now we can directly take out the I and the Q from, well, I from this point and Q from this point. Uh, and that's in baseband, it's already demodulated. Any questions about that? Okay. All right, so now we get to the fun stuff here. This is where all the nonlinearities kind of come in, or at least some of them. Um, cycle slipping. So before I go into all this text here, let me, let's take a look at the bottom figure. So remember that we made the approximation that the sign of the error phase is equal to the error phase, or the phase error rather, right? So when is that approximation valid? Well, let's, let's plot the sine of x. And we said that it was valid when x is near zero. Well, what happens when x is not near zero? Um, well, first, uh, imagine you're the PLL and you're looking at this error term and say, say the error is somewhere around here. Well, if you're the PLL, you're gonna to try to bring that error down to zero. So you're gonna to try to push it towards the origin here. And similarly, if it was a negative error, you try to push towards the origin, just it's the opposite direction. This is basically saying if you get too far, you're over the over the hill essentially it'll lock to the wrong thing or something exactly else. so if you do get over the hill as you say um the pll has no way of knowing whether you're on this side of the hill or this side so if you get some point here it sees some positive value so it'll try to push um uh, it'll try to push you this way, which is the wrong way. Um, is that right? Yeah. And no, that's not right. Other way. So it'll try to push you this way. And then similarly down here, you'll, you'll, you'll get pushed to the right. Right, so when the sine of x is negative, you get pushed to the right. And if it's positive, you'll get pushed to the left. So that's technically the right direction, but imagine, uh, you know, if, if there's a frequency offset between the reference and the VCO, that means there's gonna be an increasing phase offset. So if the phase is, you know, right here at some point and you're still not frequency locked, the phase will still keep increasing and you might get to this point right here where suddenly the PLL will try to push you to the opposite direction. And we call that phenomenon a cycle slip, right? So originally you're trying to track to um, uh, you know, zero error right here, but if you somehow get pushed past this point pi, the PLL will switch the direction in a sense and try to push you over to two pi. And so I write that out here, cycle slipping. If, if the lock time, you know, the locking mechanism, if it takes too long, then the, the VCO phase will try to lock to two pi instead of zero. Uh, 
or the, the error will become two pi instead of zero. And remember that, you know, sine is periodic by two pi, so the error still ends up being zero. So the end result is the same, but it'll, it'll take longer for the loop to lock because uh, instead of just directly going to zero error, it gets pushed out to this uh, other section of this curve and has to kind of relock um, uh, instead of directly going there. And imagine that the frequency offset was so large that this cycle slipping effect um, kept on occurring. And so the PLL never locks before the uh, before it cycle slips. And so that's that's the kind of an unstable uh, an unstable effect that occurs because of this nonlinearity. So if you assumed everything was linear, you'd never predict cycle slipping, you'd never predict instability because of that. And so because it can be unstable, we have to define something called the lock range and the colon range. So the lock range is the maximum frequency offset before the cycle slipping phenomenon can occur. So that means that the PLL will lock before it has a chance to cycle slip. And colon range is the maximum frequency offset that can be locked to if you allow for the cycle slipping to occur, but eventually the PLL will lock. And so the question is, well, first I have an example of that. So this is kind of similar to what we had before, but instead of 100 kilohertz offset, now I set it to 170 kilohertz. And so you can see exactly this effect. So before it tried to lock to 120 degrees phase offset, um, now it'll be a little higher because uh, it's 170, not 100 kilohertz. But you can see it kind of tries to lock right here. You know, it goes, the phase offset goes flat, but then suddenly it gets shifted up to this point right here where it finally locks. And this is at you know, 510 degrees or so. Uh, remember that this is periodic with 360 degrees, so you could subtract 360 from that uh, and that'll be roughly around this point right here. And if you look at the VCO control signal, which is related to the error signal, see it's, the error starts off high, which is to be expected. And then it tries to correct. The PLL will, will do its best to correct, but then it crosses zero here. Um, and it gets near where it should be. But then suddenly there's a cycle slip and the error shoots up again and eventually it corrects to where it should be and settles down. Um, I don't know if, yeah, I don't have a time domain version of this, uh, of what the waveforms actually look like, but it's, it's not super interesting. Um, now the question is, what if the frequency offset is so large that we get that cycle slipping instability phenomenon I talked about earlier. So in this case, I set the frequency offset to 200 kilohertz, um, which happens to cause this effect in this PLL. And you can see exactly what's happening. So, you know, it starts off nice, you know, it tries to lock, but then suddenly it cycle slips and jumps up and it keeps doing that for until the PLL turns off, right, for infinity. And if you look at the control voltage, you see this oscillating behavior. So, you know, the air starts off high, which again is to be expected. It um, goes down and then cycle slips, air goes back up, tries to correct again, cycle slips again, and so on. Um, and that is, a problem. <laughs> and there's ways to quantify what the pull-in range and the lock range will be for a PLL. Um, and I can give you some references if you're interested. But uh, it's a nonlinear phenomenon which uh, you know you, you, you don't hear about much in university classes, at least at the undergraduate level. Um, so I, I think that's a pretty interesting thing to look at. Anyway, that's all I have for today.
Um, so unless there's any questions, we can call it a day. Very cool. If you do say so yourself. I do say so myself. Very, very nice. But I, I do have one complaint. Yes. Uh, could you go to the second slide, please? The outline? Uh, might be. Uh, could you go to the third slide, please? Okay. <laughs> right. So you said they have cesium atomic clocks, right? Sometimes rubidium, yes. Uh, you spelled cesium wrong. Did I? Yeah. That's unfortunate. <laughs> yeah, that's my only complaint. Did you write okay. that down? You were waiting to say this. Yeah, I, I was waiting. <laughs> it's incredible. All right, well, we can keep it up there for posterity. All right, well, we'll call it a day then.